In the midst of a quiet evening, Duke Ben Zark found himself indulging in a solitary meal within the confines of his room. The atmosphere was calm until a sudden intrusion disrupted the tranquility. Maven, the bearer of unsettling news, declared with an air of urgency. Lady Adeline said that if you don't go down, she'll starve herself to death. As the words hung in the air, Benzark's hand, poised to take a bite, froze in midair. He raised his head with disbelief, grappling to comprehend the gravity of what he had just heard. Did she really say that? questioned Benzark, abandoning his fork and clasping his hands together in front of him. Maven affirmed the distressing statement. Yes, I very clearly heard her say kill myself. The weight of Lady Adeline's proclamation lingered, painting a complex tableau of emotions on Benzark's countenance. She really is quite a troublesome woman, sighed Benzark, visibly taken aback by the unexpected revelation. The idea that his newly wedded bride would resort to such extremes left him genuinely surprised. Oh, H. My, at this rate, there are going to be rumors about Duke Benzark starving his new bride. Maven chimed in with a touch of playful concern, subtly nudging and encouraging Ben Zark to descend and share a meal with Lady Adeline. And it would be a shame for the Ben Zark house. That because Duke Ben Zark refused to feed her. His new bride. Maven continued, weaving a narrative that teased at the potential consequences of neglect. Annoyance etched across his face, Ben Zark interjected. All right, I got it. Could you stop lecturing me? He pushed his chair back, signaling his intent to address the situation. Ha! Prepare a meal for me downstairs. He commanded in a firm tone, recognizing the necessity to confront Lady Adeline and clarify the extent of her knowledge about him. This unexpected turn of events not only demanded resolution, but also presented an opportunity to delve deeper into their relationship dynamics. And in an unexpected revelation, he found himself not entirely adverse to the prospect. He thought. After a brief interval, they descended to the lower level, Lady Adeline poised in anticipation. The untouched meal before her served as a testament to her anticipation of Duke Benzark's arrival. As he entered, a vivid smile illuminated her face, and she greeted him cheerfully. So you've come. Undeterred, he silently claimed the seat in front of her choosing not to acknowledge her enthusiasm. Thank you for the clothes. I'll be careful not to ruin them. She extended an olive branch, attempting to initiate a smoother exchange. Her smile persisted, radiating warmth despite his reserved demeanor. H, yes. They fit you well, despite being men's clothes. He responded with an air of nonchalance, seemingly unfazed by the compliment. Is that really your only sentiment? Lady Adeline inquired, her tone turning cold as she locked eyes with him, seeking a more meaningful acknowledgement. You are now my husband, your grace. Shouldn't you at least say it suits me well or that it looks pretty? She pressed further, attempting to convey the desires of her heart, puzzled by his apparent indifference. You're requesting a lot from me, Benzark retorted, maintaining a downward gaze, revealing little about his own sentiments. If you don't like it, should I just return home? Lady Adeline questioned innocently, injecting a note of vulnerability into the conversation. What are you going to do? You're the one that asked me to marry you, remember? If you want to indulge me, you should do it. But I didn't know you were an irresponsible man. She continued, airing grievances and expressing dissatisfaction. Undeterred, she asserted her position with unwavering determination. You keep acting like my wife despite the fact you didn't take my last name. Yeah, I.D. suits you. Benzark conceded, his words laden with a sense of unburdening, as if acknowledging her presence was a begrudging acceptance of a perceived obligation. The complex dynamics of their relationship unfolded, leaving an intriguing narrative of unspoken emotions and uncharted territory. Expressing gratitude for the compliment, Lady Adeline couldn't help but delve into the lingering matter of her not adopting Duke Benzark's name. Leaning forward on the table, she confronted him directly, seeking clarity on his thoughts. In response, Benzark, seemingly exasperated, rolled his eyes, hinting at a weariness that transcended the current conversation. 
Is it too late to cancel the marriage now? Benzark's rhetorical question carried an undertone of frustration, an expression of being done with the complexities surrounding their union. Haha, ha, it was just a joke. Shall we eat now? The food will get cold. Lady Adeline attempted to diffuse the tension, directing his attention towards the neglected meal. In that moment, a fleeting thought crossed her mind. Did Ray, her past acquaintance, ever lend her his ear like this? Could a bit of greediness in her desires lead to a more fulfilling connection? I'll call you Ray, she declared abruptly, her tone asserting rather than asking or requesting, marking a shift in their relationship dynamics. Do as you please, Ben Zark responded nonchalantly, engrossed in his dinner. Adeline contemplated the potential nuances of this altered life. It felt different, and she couldn't help but wonder about the unexplored aspects that lay ahead. Then, Ray, try calling me Adele. I'm sure you don't plan on continuing to call me this woman or that woman, right? She playfully suggested a new condition, half expecting resistance. However, to her surprise, Ben Zark set his fork down and sighed. As he began to utter her proposed name, Adeline experienced a sudden flashback of another man desperately extending his hand and calling her name, a memory that seemed to intertwine with the present adding a layer of complexity to their evolving relationship. As the mysterious silhouette uttered the name, Adele, Lady Adeline's eyes widened and an unexpected wave of emotion swept over her, leaving her pale and momentarily blank. The reality of the present moment only seeped back in when Benzark's concerned voice broke through her reverie. Are you all right? He inquired with genuine concern, prompting her to refocus. I tease nothing. She hastily brushed off his worry, struggling to find an appropriate response to her inexplicable reaction. Gazing at the table, her eyes fell upon the salad, providing her with a convenient excuse. The salad was just so tasty that... She chuckled, placing a hand over her mouth to stifle her laughter, attempting to divert attention away from her momentary lapse. You didn't even eat yet, Benzark remarked rolling his eyes as he delved into his dinner. Adeline, too, tried to regain composure and concentrate on her meal, yet the echoes of that enigmatic voice lingered, leaving her perplexed. What was that voice just now? She pondered, her gaze fixed on the plate before her. The amalgamation of thoughts created a sense of confusion within her. She grappled with the notion that she couldn't have forgotten if Ray had called her name. She held on to the certainty that he had never uttered her name in the past twenty-five years. Despite the fragmented nature of her memories, this much she was sure of. Unable to recall Ray's face, she questioned the intensity of the voice that sounded so desperate. The perplexing nature of the situation left her wondering why these unbidden memories were resurfacing, with only a silhouette and the recollection of his clothes imprinted in her mind. As the night draped the surroundings, Adeline found solace in the garden, silently sipping her tea while gazing at the full moon. Lost in her contemplations, she was startled when Benzark's voice pierced the tranquility. Adele, he called out, prompting her to turn around cup in hand. Are you really going to call me by my name? She queried, uncertainty tainting her expression. You were the one who wanted to be called by it. Benzark responded, nonchalantly shrugging his shoulders. Adeline's gratitude surfaced in a warm smile, an unexpected acknowledgement that seemed to catch him off guard. Nevertheless, he composed himself and ambled towards her with hands tucked in his pockets. Regardless, I had something that I wanted to ask. How much do you know about U.S.? He emphasized the word us, injecting an air of urgency into the inquiry, keen on unraveling the depths of her understanding. I know that you are a deva. She replied, exhaling with a hint of resignation, placing her cup down before locking eyes with him. I also know about the war between the heavenly realm and the demonic realm, and that the heavenly realm was defeated. She continued, shoulders shrugging as she shared the fragments of knowledge she held about their celestial reality. The weight of their shared history hung in the air, leaving room for more questions and the unexplored intricacies of their intertwined destinies. The backdrop of a heavenly demonic war, an epic that unfolded 512 years ago, beckons the need for elucidation. 
This conflict transpired within the realm humans dubbed home, the Middle Realm, initially a neutral ground between the Heavenly Realm and Demonic Realm. Originally, the Middle Realm served as a haven for the Deva of the Heavenly Realm and the Azura of the Demonic Realm to indulge in their pursuits. However, the sanctity of this neutral ground was shattered when the promise to refrain from invading the Middle Realm was broken. In the ensuing protracted conflict, the Devas succumbed to defeat at the hands of the Azura, with Ray, the Deva's last leader, known as Derlet. This intricate narrative was conveyed to Adeline in her previous life by Benzark. However, the tales she heard were conspicuously silent about Benzark himself, leaving her curious about his untold story and yearning to learn more about him. As she gazed at him with a tinge of sadness, realizing the impossibility of unveiling his past, she found herself compelled to resort to a fabrication. I had multiple dreams. Some were clear and some were blurry, she asserted, clearing her throat before commencing her narrative. So that's why I wanted to hear your story. How you were born, how you have lived, and what you wish Tio do. She continued, acknowledging the prior deception while expressing genuine curiosity about Benzark's life. This time, her desire for truth surpassed any pretense, as she earnestly sought to unravel the layers of his existence and comprehend his aspirations. About me? He murmured, and in that moment, the tapestry of his entire existence unfurled before him. All that filled his vision was a dimly lit room, a solitary chair, and a glimpse of brightness beyond the window. Now that he thought about it, he realized that he had never truly contemplated his own identity. His focus had been consumed by evading the gaze of the Azura, surviving the shadows of revenge, and nurturing the desire to seize the tree of life. The past held little significance. There wasn't much to discuss. He could recall the relentless war, observing it from a distance while his sole objective remained survival. He simply endured. He simply lived. Amidst this introspective journey, Adeline observed him stealing glances, her patience sustained as she awaited his words. Lost in the recesses of his thoughts, he seemed temporarily detached from the ongoing conversation. I... He attempted to articulate, his voice breaking the silence, leaving an anticipation hanging in the air as he grappled with the complexities of articulating his own narrative. Benzark, with a solemn demeanor, commenced sharing a part of his life story with Adeline, revealing aspects he had guarded closely. His revelation began with the profound statement, I was born from the Tree of Life, a few months before the war started. This tree held a significant place in the origin of Devis, divine beings, emerging from its colossal branches. Standing with poise, Ben Zark had his arms folded across his chest, a contemplative stance as he delved into the details. In an effort to enrich Adeline's understanding of the Devis, Ben Zark continued, Did you know that Deva and Azura grow up faster than humans? It only takes about three or four months to match the appearance of a five to six year old human child. His gaze, unwavering, met Adeline's as he spoke, his intent to educate evident in the firmness of his tone. With a hint of gravity, Ben Zark shifted the narrative to the intricacies of Deva-Jura relations. And that's when the treaty between the Deva and Azura dissolved. They both tried to make the Middle Realm their own, ignoring the rules of the gods. His words carried the weight of historical conflict as he highlighted the deterioration of the once amicable relationship between the Devis and Azuras. A pivotal moment marked by the violation of divine rules, where both factions sought dominion over the Middle Realm. In a nuanced explanation, Benzark touched upon the perception of Devis and Azuras by humans. The relationship between the Deva and Azura wasn't initially that bad. Since humans worshipped U.S., they classified the white deva as good and the black azura as evil. Dot. This classification mirrored the human tendency to simplify complex celestial dynamics, casting the devas as benevolent and the azuras as malevolent based on worship patterns. Benzark's revelation unfolded, weaving together elements of celestial birth, accelerated growth, and the intricate dance between devas and azuras in the realm of gods and mortals. However, Benzark, with a tone of somber reflection, emphasized the commonality between celestial beings and humans. 
Our nature isn't any different from humans. We are both good and evil, just like them. That's why sometimes we help them and other times harass them and even descended to mingle with them as incarnations. He shared insights into the intricate relationship between Devas and humans, detailing how they would occasionally intertwine with mortals, either as children or assuming another human form. A connection forged through worship before the onset of the war. That's probably why we both desired the Middle Realm even more. Benzark's revelation continued shedding light on the shared aspirations of Devis and Azuras for dominion over the Middle Realm. As Adeline observed, Benzark's voice took on a subdued quality, hinting at the weight of his emotions. Ray, she murmured, acknowledging the evident sorrow in Benzark's narrative. The enormity of his experiences became palpable. The fights were common, so we didn't think it would last that long. But the war quickly spread to the Middle Realm, and the Deva started losing. It was because the demon queen Camilla, the Azura's leader, had been preparing for the war all along. They ended up reaching the heavenly realm and burned down the Tree of Life, the origin of U.S. The divine power coming from the tree shattered completely. Unable to use their divine power, the Devas lost in no time. In the midst of the war, Ben Zark recounted the pivotal moments of the war revealing the strategic prowess of Camilla, the demon queen. The devastation escalated as the heavenly realm fell, and the tree of life, the very source of divine power for the devas, succumbed to flames. The incapacitation of their divine abilities led to the swift defeat of the devas in the conflict that unfolded. In a poignant recollection, Benzar touched upon his own journey, remembering how he was designated as the successor by Delat, despite his youth, amidst the tumultuous war. The gravity of responsibility thrust upon him added another layer to the complexity of his experiences. I was designated as Durlet's successor, but before I could receive his teachings, Fabian, the Durlet at the time, died. I was suddenly entrusted with the position of the Heavenly Realm's leader. The Azures kept swarming in to annihilate the Devas, and my companions and family just died helplessly. Benzark's voice quivered as he laid bare the depth of his pain and the profound suffering he endured. The loss of his companions and family in the face of relentless onslaughts weighed heavily on him, the magnitude of the tragedy evident in his recounting. The Devis who managed to survive fell into a deep slumber called tranquility in order to heal their wounds. As the sole survivor, I had to find them in their tranquility. And as a stroke of good luck in the midst of misfortune— the demon queen had also fallen into tranquility. Benzark's narrative continued, revealing a peculiar turn of events amid the chaos. The demon queen's entry into a healing slumber provided him an unexpected advantage, allowing him to conceal his presence while seeking out the surviving Devis. Among those he encountered were AAS and Wacken, compounding the tapestry of his experiences. He nearly choked on his words as he concluded, recounting the arduous journey he and his people faced. Adeline, empathetic and attentive, felt a surge of sympathy for him, her gaze unwavering as she listened intently to his tale. Did you find them in the Middle Realm? Adeline inquired, seeking further clarification. Yes. Since the Heavenly Realm was destroyed, they could only sleep in the Middle Realm. Then this land, the land of darkness, is... Humans abandoned this land, calling it ominous. But thanks to that, ID became a suitable land for U.S. to gather our power. Benzark's response unraveled the connection between the Devis and the Forsaken Land, highlighting the irony that transformed it into a sanctuary for them to regroup and regain their strength. Gesturing towards the encompassing darkness of the Land of Darkness, Benzark continued his narrative, describing the Forsaken Land as a backdrop to their struggles. The night deepened with each passing second, the untouched teacup standing as a silent testament to the gravity of the conversation. Adeline, her attention undivided, absorbed his words. So in the end, you're trying to take revenge. Adeline's smile bore a subtle pain, acknowledging the weight of Benzark's mission. Yes. I'll wake up all of my companions from their tranquility and gather our power once again in order to kill the demon Queen Camilla. After that, I will retrieve the Tree of Life. 
because I need to carry out the Durlet's calling and rebuild the heavenly realm. Ben Zark laid bare his intricate plans, his determination evident in every word as he shared his vision of rescue and restoration. However, in Adeline's eyes, he appeared not as a cold-hearted leader but as a man who, unbeknownst to himself, had endured immense solitude and struggles. Her sympathy for him deepened. You are so brave. Even though you must have been lonely for that long period of time. I'll be on your side from now on, so do not worry anymore. Adeline stood, her cold hand resting on his arm, a gesture of reassurance and solidarity. She sought to comfort Ben Zark, pledging her support. Ben Zark, looking down at her hand on his arm, released a slight tension, allowing her gesture to register. Loneliness, huh? Ben Zark nonchalantly shrugged his shoulders, contemplating the emotion that lingered within him. The revelation of his innermost thoughts to Adeline left him questioning the reasons behind this newfound transparency. Was it the profound sense of loneliness that had prompted him to share his burdens? The cool touch of Adeline's hand seemed to echo the chill within him. As soon as Adeline departed, a profound feeling of helplessness overwhelmed Ben Zark, compelling him to reflect on their conversation. The passing of one month unfolded swiftly, marked by the hustle and bustle of maids and servants in the castle corridors. Maven, amidst the commotion, found himself caught up in the flurry of activity. Arg, I'm so busy. H, wait a moment. That tree shouldn't be there, but in the training grounds. Maven's exclamation resonated loudly amid the chaotic sounds, emphasizing the heightened state of affairs. No! Please bring that table to the living room. Hmm. Maven directed the servants, pointing towards a wooden table in transit, meticulously managing the castle's logistics. Adeline's numerous orders added to the whirlwind of responsibilities that kept Maven occupied. All right, let's fix the garden first. It's way too dreary. Please hire a gardener. Oh, and an architect as well. Adeline's authoritative commands flowed as she surveyed the landscape from a vantage point in the castle. Maven, dutifully executing each directive, played a crucial role in realizing Adeline's vision for the castle's improvement. The once bustling corridors and rooms now buzzed with purpose and activity, a reflection of the changes initiated by Adeline's keen eye for enhancement. Whenever Maven received an order from Adeline, he promptly sought out Ben Zark who seemed to be operating in an automatic mode, tirelessly repeating his commitment to fulfill Adeline's wishes. The atmosphere conveyed a sense of detachment, as if Ben Zark were indifferent to the ongoing transformations or perhaps found solace in the flurry of activity. Despite the weeks of tireless work, both servants and inhabitants of the castle expressed contentment with the final outcome. The once dreary surroundings now exuded a newfound radiance, adorned with beautiful trees and gardens that captivated the eyes. On the day of the grand revelation, as Adeline admired the lively atmosphere she had orchestrated, a joyful exclamation from the crowd caught everyone's attention. Maven, initially dismissive, soon realized he recognized the voice. Turning around, he was met with a surprising sight. Wow! What's all this? Someone from the crowd expressed astonishment, and Maven, Sensing familiarity, couldn't ignore the inkling that he knew the voice. With mixed emotions, he turned around to confirm his suspicion. Huh! Wacken! Maven exclaimed in disbelief. Wacken, a brown-haired individual with a bright smile, stood before him. The unexpected presence of Wacken brought a mix of surprise and joy to the bustling scene. Meanwhile, in the office, Ben Zark and Aster were engrossed in important discussions when the door swung open with a thud. Captain? Did you really get married? Wacken burst into the room, his disbelief echoing through the space. The revelation of Ben Zark's marital status left Wacken in a state of shock, unable to comprehend the unexpected turn of events. Wacken, still adorned in his cloak with a sword at his back, burst into the room with a furious inquiry. Captain? Did you really get married? Ben Zark, momentarily taken aback by Wacken's sudden entrance, shifted his attention from the documents before him to the intense scene unfolding. Yes, Ben Zark replied calmly, resuming his reading. 
Wacken, in a swift motion, closed the distance and forcefully placed both hands on the table, leaning in with a barrage of questions. What? Why? When? With who? How? Each word carried the weight of Wacken's incredulity, poised to extract answers. Before Ben's art could respond, Aster, seizing the opportunity, interjected. Because she's a prophet, about a month ago, back when you were stranded in the Frostlands. Her name's Adeline. She's from the Roten family. And do I really need to explain the how part? Aster's mocking tone added a layer of amusement to the revelation. Wacken, infuriated by Aster's interference, shot him an angry look. Shut up and stay out of this. I'm talking to the captain, not you. Wacken's loud retort echoed in the room, emphasizing the singular nature of his conversation with Ben Zark. Ben Zark, a silent spectator, observed the unfolding drama before him. You're not talking to anyone. All you're doing is shouting by yourself. Aster, rolling his eyes, dismissed Wacken's attempts at communication, provoking further fury from the already incensed Wacken. The room simmered with tension as the trio engaged in this unexpected confrontation. I told you to shut up. Why'd you let the captain get married anyway? You should have stopped him. Wacken's frustration erupted in a vehement shout directed at both Ben Zark and Aster. The sense of being left out fueled his anger, compounded by the realization that they proceeded with the captain's marriage without his input or consent. What for? I'm the one who told him to get married in the first place. Aster's nonchalant response, accompanied by a casual shrug, only served to further agitate Wacken. What the hell? Why you? The limits of Wacken's patience were tested as his face turned a fiery red, attempting to restrain his anger and catch his breath. Despite his efforts, he couldn't contain himself, erupting into a tirade. I wanted to be the one to find the perfect wife for the captain. Wacken sought to justify his intense reaction, revealing the depth of his feelings on the matter. If you wanted to do it that badly, then maybe you should have acted a little sooner, huh? Aster's taunting retort further escalated the tension between them, their furious gazes locked in a heated exchange. This is a waste of time. I'm going to see that girl for myself. Wacken, Conceding the futility of the argument, abruptly turned away from Aster and Ben's arc, determined to address Adeline directly. The room echoed with the remnants of their conflict as Wacken stormed out, leaving Aster and Ben's arc to process the aftermath of his outburst. He makes a commotion every single time he comes by, Aster remarked, his gaze fixed on the door slammed shut by Wacken. Turning to face Ben's arc, he inquired, do you think it was all right to let him go like that, Captain? It's fine. Leave him be. Ben Zark responded, a hint of amusement evident as he rested his hand under his chin, accompanied by a subtle grin. His demeanor suggested an eagerness to witness Wacken's encounter with Adeline. But, Aster hesitated briefly, but upon recognizing the true reason behind Ben Zark's smile, he smirked. Well, I guess you're right. After all, even you couldn't do anything about her. This shared amusement hinted at the prospect of Wacken struggling in the face of Adeline's influence. Exactly. Even if we don't do anything, she'll have Wacken wrapped around her finger in no time. Ben Zark declared, finding a certain enjoyment in the unfolding drama. Despite the light-hearted tone, a subtle undercurrent of concern lingered as Ben Zark contemplated advising Wacken to tread lightly. What the hell was Aster thinking? Meanwhile, Wacken, fueled by rage, stormed towards the garden, grappling with the implications of the situation. This is the Durlitz wife we're talking about, he muttered to himself, expressing discontent at being excluded from such a crucial decision. How could he make such an important decision on his own while I was away in the Frostlands? If I find out she's just some common, ordinary woman, I'll kick her out myself. Wacken continued grumbling, the sword on his back nearly touching the ground as he walked with purpose. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to Maven and Catherine standing before a lady with her back turned. Unconventionally dressed, her long wavy blonde hair caught Wacken's eye, prompting him to pause behind the bushes, scrutinizing her with a mix of curiosity and determination. 
the unfolding scene set the stage for a potentially intense encounter. That must be her, Wacken murmured to himself, his attention fixed on the lady with the long wavy blonde hair. Determined to make his presence known, he bellowed. H-E-Y-U. The tone of Wacken's voice caught Catherine and Maven off guard, leading them to hesitate as Maven nervously scratched his neck. Adeline, initially shocked, swiftly composed herself and responded calmly. H.M.? Oh, don't be alarmed. I'm perfectly all right. Let's carry on, Adeline assured, her poise unwavering. Turning her attention to Catherine, she instructed. Catherine, go fetch me some cool tea. Projecting her voice for Wacken to hear. Yes, my lady, Catherine acknowledged before disappearing towards the house. Unfazed by Wacken's interruption, Adeline continued. Let's see over there is where we'll have the lilacs planted. The rest can face the opposite direction, gesturing towards another part of the garden. With Maven by her side, she subtly started walking in that direction. Did she ignore me just now? Wacken, unable to comprehend being overlooked, twitched and flinched with anger. Unrelenting, he shouted once more. H-E-Y. Do you have any idea who I am? Adeline, turning her head slightly, responded with an icy tone. On the contrary, do you have any idea who I am? Are you so foolish as to be rude toward me even after being aware of my status, Wacken? Her cold growl pierced through the air, challenging Wacken's audacity. H, how did you know my... Wacken stuttered before Adeline, with an air of authority, interjected. And oh, more importantly, who are you calling foolish? The confrontation escalated, leaving Wacken momentarily stunned, caught between his stuttered inquiry and Adeline's cutting retort. Answer my question. Do you or do you not know who I am? Adeline's gaze bore into Wacken, her eyes radiating an intense coldness. Of course, your ladyship. You must think you're so high and mighty now, huh? But your marriage doesn't change the fact that you're still nothing but a huma. Wacken smirked as he approached her, the wind hastening around them, causing the trees and leaves to rustle. So, you know I am Adeline Lawton, the wife of Duke Hyrath Benzak. Hyrath Benzak is your master, the one you serve. Adeline enunciated each word with precision, her voice cutting through the air. As Wacken paused near the bushes, Adeline, not one to back down, advanced towards him, causing the grass beneath her feet to rustle. Therefore, when you disrespect me, the wife of your master, you also disrespect him. Or perhaps, that was your original intention? Adeline joyously emphasized her point, stopping in front of the bushes. I would never disrespect Captain. I only... Wacken's flustered response betrayed the impact of Adeline's boldness and remarks. Adeline, rolling her eyes, caught sight of a sword peeking from behind Wacken, its glint capturing her attention. Her eyes widened. That sword. It's the holy sword Nicagras. She pointed towards the sword, her words deliberate and measured. H, how do you know about this sword? Wacken, visibly startled, sought answers to Adeline's unexpected knowledge of the sacred weapon. Didn't Aster or Ray tell you? I'm a prophet. Adeline calmly disclosed her true identity. Th they were telling the truth? Wacken froze in his place, grappling with the realization. You claim to be loyal to your master, and yet have no faith in what he says. Adeline sighed heavily, gesturing her head in both directions. She then directed her attention towards the sword. That sword. She pointed at it and continued. It's asleep right now. But I can wake it from its slumber. If I do so, will you accept me as the wife of your master? Adeline posed the question slowly, probing Wacken's allegiance. You can awaken it? Wacken, cautiously intrigued, took hold of the sword and presented it to her. That's impossible. He smirked and elaborated. This sword fell asleep after the tree of life in the divine realm died. Unless the tree grows back, IT can't be awakened. So what would a mere human like you be able to do? He raised the sword, expressing skepticism. What have you got to lose by believing me? Besides, that sword must be very precious to you. 
Didn't I to used to be Commander Fabian's? Adeline shrugged, emphasizing the sword's significance. I lost it. During the war. I only found it again recently. This sword isn't important to just me. It's important to all of us. It was our commander's sword. Can you really awaken it? The only reason this sword is in my care is because it's lost its light. If it can regain its former power, I'd like to give it to the captain. Wacken spoke with genuine affection for the sword, expressing a readiness to witness its reawakening. As he raised the sword in front of them, a blue sapphire embedded in it caught the light, adding a touch of mystique to the unfolding scene. So let me ask you again. Can you return this sword to Ardalot? Wacken inquired with hope shimmering in his eyes. Of course I can, if that is what you desire. Adeline reached for the sword's handle. However, Wacken, the reason why I intend to wake this sword is because I want you to protect your Dalat with it. She held the sword, locking eyes with Wacken, who scrutinized her with intent. So, Adeline placed her finger on the sapphire and began murmuring spells. Wacken's eyes widened as a blue light spread, enveloping the sword suspended in the air. The surrounding environment succumbed to the enchantment, with trees rustling in the powerful wind and Adeline's long wavy hair dancing in the air. The sapphire on the sword started sparkling, signaling its awakening. Wacken couldn't believe his eyes. It's the language of the Devis. How is this possible? She's human, I'm sure of it. What exactly is she? Wacken murmured in disbelief. Wacken, take this sword. It's yours. Can you trust me now? Adeline attempted to hand over the sword with an innocent smile. Despite her stature compared to Wacken, it felt as if he stood before his captain, prompting him to lower his gaze. It is an honor to meet you, Duchess Adeline Benzark. I beg your forgiveness for my rudeness earlier. My name is Wacken H. W. Wyan. I hereby swear to use that sword to protect the Durlet, as you have commanded. Wacken knelt down, seeking forgiveness. Adeline chuckled, radiating warmth. Very good, Wacken. Then allow me to formally introduce myself as well. I am Adeline Lawton. It's a pleasure to meet you, she added with a chuckle. But please call me Adeline. In the aftermath of Wacken's confrontation with Adeline, a palpable tension hung in the air as he hastily made his way back to the office. Benzark and Astor's attentive gazes locked onto him as he barged through the entrance. Captain, Wacken gasped, struggling to catch his breath. Astor, turning with an air of skepticism, inquired, What happened? You've come back somehow looking even more ridiculous than when you stormed off. Did Adeline hit you or something? Astor's words carried a tinge of suspicion highlighting the evident transformation in Wacken's demeanor since his abrupt departure just moments earlier. Benzark, on the other hand, wore a sly grin, adding an intriguing layer to the unfolding scene. It's possible. Benzark retorted cryptically, leaving Wacken bewildered and at a loss for words. The room was enveloped in an uneasy silence, with Astor's probing gaze and Benzark's enigmatic grin heightening the suspense. Do you think he's really all right, Captain? Astor questioned Ben Zark, rolling his eyes in exasperation when Wacken remained mute, seemingly stunned by the recent turn of events. Ben Zark maintained his silence, opting to continue his intense scrutiny of Wacken. Breaking the silence, Wacken suddenly exclaimed, Captain? Look at this! Swiftly, he revealed a concealed sword, raising it triumphantly into the air. The blade emitted a brilliant azure glow revealing a mesmerizing blue sapphire. Aster and Benzark, now rendered speechless themselves, exchanged incredulous glances. How is this possible? Aster voiced his disbelief, reflecting the shared astonishment in the room. The unfolding mystery of the radiant sword added an unexpected layer to the already tense atmosphere, leaving the trio in anticipation of the revelations yet to come. That sword! It dash! Ben Zark sprung in place, his words faltering. Yes. The Divine Sword was still asleep before I went to meet Adeline. But after tapping it a few times, she awakened it. 
Wacken declared with conviction, his eyes gleaming with an unusual intensity. Adeline did that? Ben Zark questioned, a mixture of disbelief and introspection evident in his tone. She brought it back to life. My first thought was that maybe our tree of life had grown back. But then I realized that you'd be the first to know if that ever happened. And I thought Aster was lying earlier when he said Adeline was a prophet. But after hearing her speak the language of the devas, I had no choice but to believe it. Wacken recounted the events, pulling Aster into the conversation with a deliberate motive, knowing it would provoke him. However, the focus remained on the revelation of the awakened divine sword. You couldn't say that without calling me a liar, could you? Aster, visibly angered, threatened Wacken with a punch, their confrontation overshadowing Benzark's presence. The two locked eyes, a silent challenge brewing between them. What was that? You looking for a fight? Let's go, then. I've got the divine sword now. Wacken taunted, challenging Aster. Like even that could help you. Follow me out to the training hall. We'll see who's the strongest. Aster chuckled and smirked, accepting Wacken's challenge. Meanwhile, Ben Zark, not drawn into their impending clash, remained fixated on Wacken's revelation. Adeline spoke in the language of the Davis? Ben Zark pondered, well aware that humans, in general, could learn the language but were incapable of speaking it. The exception was prophets. Adeline, his wife, was a prophet. Despite this knowledge, a sense of unease settled within him as thoughts of Adeline occupied his mind. In the garden downstairs, Adeline stood frozen at the precise spot where Wacken had left her, her thoughts deeply entrenched in the echoes of her past life. Amidst the reflective tide, a specific recollection surfaced, a pivotal moment when the very sword that had now been awakened was stirred to life by another, Gila. Adeline vividly recalled the scene. Wacken raising the sword, and Hila, through a touch, invoking its power, leading Wacken to kneel in reverence. The corridor bathed in an ethereal blue glow, with Aster and Ben Zark rendered speechless by Hila's presence. In the shadows, Adeline found herself reduced to a spectator, tears streaming down her face. In the past, Hila was the one who awakened that sword. But this time, she was the one who did it. Adeline contemplated admitting a subtle sense of astonishment at her own unexpected success. Her amusement manifested in a soft chuckle as she observed her hand radiating with magical energy. The realization of her latent powers left her both intrigued and cautious. Surrounded by the bustling activity of servants in the garden, Adeline cast a sidelong glance, recognizing the need for discretion. The revelation of her abilities, particularly in front of Wacken, had evidently shocked even him. Recollecting her past life, Adeline acknowledged Aster's teachings in magic, a skill she honed diligently, allowing her to wield magic effortlessly without the need for incantations. She reminisced about those dedicated years of practice, culminating in the day she mastered simple spells. The memory of that achievement spurred her to run through the corridors and, with her newfound powers, successfully halt Duke Ben Zark in his tracks. As Adeline navigated the delicate balance of concealing her abilities and harnessing them, a newfound sense of responsibility took root, guiding her steps in this intricate dance of past and present. Wait, your grace! Adeline held his arm, eager to showcase the magic she had learned for Ray, a skill she had never had the chance to display in his presence. Her desire to demonstrate her capabilities and the extent to which she could contribute to their world prompted her to offer a small exhibition. With a flicker of her practiced magic, a cup of tea materialized on a plate with a spoon. Yet, her excitement quickly dissipated when she unintentionally spilled the contents of the cup. W, what do you think? I can use simple magic like this instantly now. I don't. Adeline began enthusiastically, her joy abruptly stifled by Benzark's cold voice. Make sure you never use that power in front of others. Benzark asserted his silhouette blurring as tears welled in Adeline's eyes. Shocked and disheartened, she struggled to recall Benzark's expressions from her hazy past memories. You excuse me? Adeline flinched, seeking an explanation, but Benzark remained silent. Why? 
A cascade of questions lingered on her lips, but her head hung low as tears streamed down her face. From that day forward, she refrained from showcasing her magical abilities in the presence of others. Reflecting on the incident, Adeline realized that the magic she employed wasn't particularly complex. The issue lay in her ability to wield it effortlessly without reciting an incantation. Contemplating a solution, she pondered the idea of pretending to recite incantations whenever she employed magic, surmising that if it posed a problem then, it likely remained a concern now. The incomplete nature of her memories left her yearning for a clearer understanding of Ray's reaction during that pivotal moment. Was it truly anger? For some reason, she felt as though it wasn't anger, but worry. She pondered this thought with a tinge of sadness, delving into the complexities of emotions. Your Grace, would you like for us to place the tea table over here? Rebecca's loud call abruptly brought her back to reality. Adeline turned towards the bushes where Rebecca and the others stood, having set up the entire tea table. Grateful for the distraction, she walked towards them and took her seat. The manor has gotten livelier with you here, my lady. Rebecca exclaimed cheerfully while wiping off a cup. Everyone's been overjoyed with the change, she added, further emphasizing the positive impact Adeline had made. I'm glad to hear it. Adeline chuckled, appreciating the warmth in Rebecca's words and the compliment. Is it true that they're building a training hall over there? Rebecca inquired with curiosity, prompting Adeline to respond excitedly. Yes. I'm planning on recruiting some new knights to assist Duke Ben's arc. Adeline confirmed, her anticipation for the developments in the manner evident in her enthusiastic tone. The prospect of the training hall and the recruitment of new knights signaled a positive shift in the dynamics of the estate, and Adeline couldn't help but look forward to the changes taking shape under her influence. You have so many wonderful ideas, my lady, Rebecca remarked, placing the cup on the plate with a clink sound. Considering what little there was for Adeline to do in her past life, she had a lot of time to think, though she couldn't exactly share that with Rebecca. I intend to learn swordsmanship from Wacken as well. Adeline responded calmly as Rebecca poured tea into the cup. You, your grace? Rebecca was stunned, unable to speak further. Adeline smiled sweetly, nodding her head. Excitedly closing her eyes, she put her hands under her chin. Why, of course. I've always dreamt of wielding a powerful sword and becoming the greatest knight in the world. If I have whack and teach me, perhaps I can finally make that dream come true. She continued, her voice rising with excitement. Rebecca chuckled at Adeline's passion. Ha ha! I didn't know you had such a playful side, my lady. Rebecca thought it was a jest, but Adeline was serious. She needed to learn swordsmanship to better conceal her ability to use magic instantly. Adeline sipped tea peacefully, contemplating the necessity of finding a powerful sword that wouldn't arouse suspicion. A memory flashed of Ben Zark holding a sword, shielding her on a snowy day. She resolved not to hide behind his back again. Though I do mean it when I say I want to become strong. I want to be so powerful that I'll never be swayed by anyone. Adeline declared passionately. I'm not sure I entirely understand your concerns, my lady, but you shouldn't worry. Rebecca reassured, unable to grasp the full context but offering agreement nonetheless. Even as you are now, I don't think you'd be swayed by anyone. You're the strongest person I know, my lady. Rebecca complimented sincerely, smiling at Adeline. Ha ha, I see. Thank you, Rebecca. Adeline's cheeks flushed with gratitude for the supportive words that resonated deeply within her. In her recollections, Adeline found herself at the center of a heated discussion, subjected to disdainful glares from those around her. Do we really have to take that girl with us? Did you forget that the captain almost died because of that girl? Aster expressed strong displeasure at the prospect of bringing Adeline along on their trip. We're bringing her with us. Ben Zark asserted, advancing toward the door without acknowledging Adeline. Despite his lack of acknowledgement, his directive seemed to shield her from the harsh words. Captain? Aster shouted, turning to give Adeline a disdainful look. Tisk, he added, rolling his eyes. 
Tears welled up in Adeline's eyes as she felt the weight of their collective disapproval. She felt utterly useless to them. Even Hila, echoing Aster's scorn, followed Ben's arc without a second glance. Adeline grappled with her embarrassment, wondering why Ray continued to include her when no one expected anything from her. Ray, she murmured sadly, gazing at the closed door. The memories flooded back, reminding her of the nights when Ben Zark interrogated her. What did you find out today? Ben Zark would question her, hoping for answers. However, Adeline, feeling helpless, could only kneel on the floor in front of him, remaining silent. In moments of quiet reflection, Adeline often found herself shedding tears, grappling with the frustration of not uncovering any information. Today was no exception, she had no answers, no reply. Doubts about her ability to truly aid Ben Zark weighed heavily on her, leading to intense bouts of tears. Those days felt like recurring nightmares, haunted by the inability to contribute. Abruptly, she awoke, drenched in sweat, realizing she had merely dreamt a haunting flashback from her past life. The jarring reality struck her. Perhaps it was a repercussion of the Wacken incident. Regardless, she wondered how long it would take for her to become desensitized to these memories, questioning the duration needed to prove her usefulness and dispel her worries. Clenching her fists to regain composure, Adeline pondered, How long will it be before I grow numb to this memory? How long will I have to prove my usefulness to erase my worries? Sighing and rolling her eyes, she recognized the stark difference of her current surroundings, no longer confined to the shabby room of her past life. Now, in a luxurious room fit for a duchess, Adeline no longer faced nightly interrogations by Ray. As she strolled barefoot towards the balcony, adorned in her nightgown, the moonlit room presented a stark contrast to her previous life. Despite the positive changes, a lingering loneliness persisted. On this particular night, with Ray absent, Adeline gazed at the moon, thinking of him. Her sad eyes spoke volumes her heart couldn't express leaning on the railing. She lifted her head to the sky, watching petals from nearby trees gently descend. In the midst of conflicting emotions, she admitted her hatred and disdain for Ben Zark, wishing her heart could forget him entirely. After two months of dedicated work, the castle Adeline was overseeing was finally completed. Ben Zark, accompanied by Aster and Wacken, visited the finished structure. Wow, how in the world did the building get built within two months? What did they say they would use this building for? Aster couldn't hide his shock, eagerly questioning Ben Zark, who was equally perplexed. Wacken, displaying a silent awe, meticulously surveyed the entire building with his sword still hanging on his back. Captain, did Adeline not explain? You don't know. Aster asked Ben Zark, taken aback by the lack of information. Ben Zark remained silent, unable to find words to explain the swift construction. I think it would be quicker to just ask Adeline nowadays, Aster remarked, rolling his eyes upon realizing that even Ben Zark was at a loss for words. If this continues, we might end up calling Adele the captain instead. Well, Adele is indeed a captain since she's the captain's wife, Wacken commented, accompanied by a thoughtful sigh. What's with the compliments so suddenly? Aster eyed Wacken suspiciously. Before they could delve further into the matter, Adeline's voice came from behind. That is the new dormitory for the knights we will be hiring, she replied, addressing their uncertainties. Unbeknownst to them, she had utilized magic to expedite the construction, a detail she chose not to disclose. A dormitory? Our night order is not large enough to manage a dormitory. Aster questioned, folding his arms across his chest. Besides Deva, we'll be using mercenaries in order to augment the night order. Adeline calmly explained, standing next to Ben's Ark. Hmm. Aster, still in shock, sought clarification, momentarily forgetting Adeline was present. Captain? What sort of bullshit is this? He exclaimed loudly, catching Adeline completely off guard. I don't remember receiving any reports. Ben Zark, flustered by the unexpected revelation, struggled to recall any such discussions. His murmurings were audible, prompting Adeline to roll her eyes. 
There is no way that's true. There is no way that I would decide on something so critical so haphazardly by myself. I definitely received permission through Maven. How weird. Should we call Maven and ask him? Adeline asserted, adopting a firm tone and suggesting a call to Maven. Ben's arc began to realize she might be right, recalling Maven presenting Adeline's proposals during his autowork mode. CPN. CMT NSM FRBT. Aster, using abbreviations, indicated to Ben Zark to come out and see him for a bit, showcasing his frustration. I'm doomed, Ben Zark thought to himself, recognizing the danger in Aster's expressions and eyes. Adeline, what do you suddenly mean by a knight order? And you're saying it'll be using mercenaries instead of normal knights? You know how rough and rude they are. Wacken, who had silently observed, finally voiced his concerns, drawing everyone's attention. I know, but how long will it be just you three moving around? Adeline's voice reflected genuine concern for their well-being. That's... Wacken attempted to speak but halted. The Deva's numbers aren't much. Not to mention they all enter tranquility, so it would take a while to awaken them. We have to receive the information from the Azura, and we have to awaken the Deva. Adeline explained the complex situation and why she believed this course of action was the best for them. Does that mean that Wacken and AAS have to move alternately every time? Even if we start recruiting normal knights this instant, how many would tread through the forest of darkness to apply? Ben Zark raised a valid point, and Aster, understanding the distinction between normal knights and mercenaries, grasped Adeline's recruitment strategy. Ah, uh, so that's why you are trying to recruit mercenary troops. Aster gasped, clenching his fist in realization. Yes, it's because mercenaries move to follow profit, and I don't think that is particularly bad. Rather, I thought that they are rather similar to us. The fact that they act more and more roughly in order to survive. Adeline, carried away by her emotions, explained her true reason for recruiting mercenaries. Composing herself, she turned to Aster excitedly. So, A.S., please teach them well, she pleaded, sporting a smile that softened her features, eliciting a cute response. What? Wait a minute, this suddenly? I've never taught humans before. Aster, startled, almost went into shock. Don't worry, A.S., you will do great. Adeline reassured him, knowing Aster had taught mercenaries in her past life. And what else? She mused turning toward Wacken and Benzark, who stared at her with bright eyes, silently questioning what about us. Her response was unexpected laughter. Sorry! I didn't mean to laugh, but you both look so much like puppies that I couldn't help it. Adeline tried to cover her smile, responding seriously, though her smile peeked through her lips and eyes. Aster and Wacken went into complete shock, realizing their captain's wife referred to the captain as a puppy. Even the demon king in tranquility would jump at those words. Huhu. I have something else I want to entrust to Wacken. She looked towards Wacken, still laughing with tears. I have something separate that I want to discuss with Ray as well. Luckily, everyone is gathered here. She turned towards Ben Zark and said softly, creating an air of anticipation. She knew they might think she was crazy, but it had to be said today. Clearing her throat, she spoke in a firm tone. I will make a path through the forest of darkness, she declared. Adeline? No matter what the forest of darkness is, Wacken attempted to interject. It's not like I don't know the significance, Dash. She began to explain, but Benzar cut her off abruptly, displaying an unprecedented anger. No, he said coldly, his voice filled with anger. As expected, he responded this way. Do you think I would suggest making a path without giving it any thought? She spoke carefully. Even still, you can't. Decorating the main castle, upturning the garden, even building an entirely new military training hall and creating a new knight order, none of that matters. But even if it's you, I can't allow you to do this. He grinded his teeth, leaving her uncertain if he was angry or worried. Even if it was her. He was talking about her in that manner because she was a prophet. Did you forget, Ray? 
I am a prophet. Do you think I wouldn't know that the forests of this land consist of heavenly realm plants? She threw her last card. You're planning something so ridiculous even though you already know? He shouted in a louder voice. And how would you know whether it is ridiculous or not before listening to what I have to say? Adeline was worked up, frustrated that Ben Zark was passing judgment before hearing her out. So what I mean is... Ben Zark attempted to speak, gauging her expressions. Ray, I will never do anything that is of detriment to you or the Devis. Do you know why? Adeline softened her voice, causing Ben Zark to flinch. My objective is, within ten years, to grant all of you your desires. I wish to spend the rest of my life on this land, comfortable and well-fed, she calmly stated, leaving everyone speechless. Within ten years, Aster questioned, thinking he misheard. They had assumed everything would take at least two hundred years, but here she was confidently declaring otherwise. If it is me, it's possible, she proudly affirmed, then turned toward Wacken. Therefore, Wacken. Ah. Uh, Yes, he eagerly responded. Please teach me swordplay from now on, Wacken. It seems I need to protect my doubtful husband myself, she cheerfully declared, glancing at Ben Zark. His face turned red with a mix of anger and embarrassment. Wacken and Aster exchanged glances behind Ben Zark, both thinking, The captain will receive protection from Adeline. I'll slaughter you if you laugh. Ben Zark grinded his teeth warning them, but it was too late. Wacken and Aster burst into laughter, thoroughly amused. Ben Zark stood there silently, watching them make fun of him. Now I think we're all done with the laughing, so will you try listening? I'll tell you why I want to make a path through the forest of darkness and how, within ten years, I will put an end to this war. She requested their attention, binding her hands behind her back and smiling as she spoke. First, I will go to Mavane Island. Adeline began to share her idea, gesturing with one hand on her back and pointing with the other. The sudden shift puzzled everyone. Uh, Adeline, we were just talking about the Forest of Darkness. How did we suddenly get to Mavane Island? Aster asked impatiently, wearing a confused expression. Will you be going personally? That place is so far that teleporting won't reach and it would take over a week to get there, even by boat. Wacken interjected, raising a valid concern. They bombarded her with questions without letting her explain, while Ben Zark silently observed. You are right. I will be going in person, and I am even planning on visiting Mokran City. She replied with a smile. Adeline, that place is... Aster hesitated, warning her cautiously. A vicious city full of awful criminals... She cut him off, answering with a smile. It was more of a question-type response, catching them off guard with her candid opinion. People don't usually make rebuttals with words. Broadly speaking, I have three reasons. I said I would be making a path through the forest of darkness, right? She began elaborating, and now all of them concentrated on listening to her. I'm not saying that I will just be making a path. I know the value that the Devis give this forest. The bizarre plants that fill the forest of darkness are actually all plants from the heavenly realm. The plants that originally only grew in the heavenly realm happened to take root in the middle realms, and that was why they were distorted so bizarrely. But the inherent power of the plants did not completely vanish, so it acts to protect the Ben's Ark Ducal family. If a normal human stepped into this forest, on the other hand, they would be overwhelmed by the plant's energy and die or go insane. We may not be able to block the manifestations of the Azura, but since we can block the avatars of the Azura who borrowed the bodies of humans. She clearly understood very well what they were worried about. Adeline explained everything she had planned for them and the Forest of Darkness. Before the heavenly demonic war erupted, the Devis, who received an ominous prophecy, spread the seeds of the heavenly realm onto this land. This was so that, on the off chance that the lands of the heavenly realm were lost, the remaining Devis could nurture their power here. I have no plans of opening such an important land so easily. However, 
I will be making it so that the path will open and close whenever we want it to, and using that, we need to thin out the people who wish to revive the Demon King. I'm planning on holding a flashy party. Has it been about 100 years since you, A.A.S. and Wacken, woke up and reclaimed the Horace name? At the end, she looked towards Ben's Ark, directly addressing him with this question. Yes, it has. Ben Zark nodded his head. Then doesn't that mean that, right about now, they'll be carefully watching us with the hungry eyes of a tiger, looking for an opportunity to infiltrate these lands? If it's me, I can tell if the person who enters is an avatar of the Azura or not. I can guarantee it. The time when your people will be able to return to their land is not far off. My reasoning for going to Mavain Island is connected to this as well. Even if I understand the theoretical part of it, I need to obtain the materials necessary for making the path. Adeline spoke in a firm tone without any fear, displaying a passion that transformed her into a different person. Must you really go? If it is materials, there should be plenty here. Ben Zark tried to stop her, fully aware she wouldn't easily change her mind. If all of the materials could be found here, I would also want to stay here. She replied with a fake smile, injecting a hint of emotion into her voice. She then shifted her attention towards Aster. But, A.A.S., the food here is awful, right? She chuckled and asked cutely. Aster, caught off guard, blurted out a hesitant. Yes. Ah, uh, no. So what I meant was. Aster tried to explain with embarrassment upon seeing Benzark's cold eyes piercing through him. It's all right. I can already tell from your expressions. It's difficult to hire a chef in a place like this, so I plan to find one while also fulfilling my own plans. There is a special chef that I wish to introduce to all of you, and he lives there. She said with a bright smile, reminiscing about someone she hadn't met in a long time. It was necessary for her to go there and bring him here. Then she continued. Not to mention, oh my! She exclaimed as if she suddenly remembered something. The mercenary troop I wish to recruit just so happens to have a clipper necessary to go to Mavane Island. What should I do? Adeline innocently inquired, focusing especially on Ben Zark. Aster raised his hand to get her attention. Adeline, do you really have to go that far? He seemed genuinely worried. Of course. I've been explaining it to you, but is anything lacking? She shrugged her shoulders. It's about the famous mercenary troop in Moquin City. You can always borrow a ship from somewhere else. They will be extremely vicious people. I don't think any of them are normal. Asta tried to warn her, hoping she might reconsider. However, she smiled and replied confidently. They have to be at that level in order to even dare come into the land of darkness. She blinked her eyes softly and smiled. Judging by their reactions, they'd faint if she told them that she was planning to awaken a sleeping siren. Adeline thought of this but kept quiet, unable to share the full extent of her plans. I also have a reason for wanting to ride that clipper. Instead, she stated firmly, Adeline, it will be difficult for me to answer right away, but you have to think that, once you leave these lands, everyone is an enemy. You are an important person to us, Adele. Aster expressed his concerns as a great friend. That is really nice to hear, but I also have a lot that I entrust to you. Just as I am important as the prophet, all of you are necessary to me, and so I wish to do my best. She replied in a low, firm tone, looking at them as if she was trying to assure them that she could manage it all. She looked directly at Ben Zark, conveying that it would be best as she left it at that for now. This was a relationship of mutual benefits and she wanted to tell him not to make that sort of expression. She thought he'd turn his back on her again if she became useless to him. This was their relationship. She didn't even hope that they would like her. She thought everything so sadly and was just about to turn around to leave when she heard something unexpected. What are you planning to leave? It was Benzark's voice. She couldn't believe he asked her something. He asked her, For what? She was so taken aback. Her eyes widened, hope gleamed in them, and they shined brightly as she turned around to see him. He was looking towards her worriedly. 
Huh? She murmured confusingly. Captain? Aster tried to call Benzark to stop him from making foolish decisions. Now that he had listened to her reasoning, there was no reason to stop her. So what shouldn't be allowed? If it's dangerous, we can guard her. He replied simply in a strong voice, looking directly at Adeline. He walked towards her and stood in front of her. Even still, I am Adeline. She rolled her eyes. Tisk, he clicked his tongue. Yes, Adeline, he murmured, looking into her deep purple eyes with concerns. Please do not click your tongue. She rolled her eyes with carelessness. I understand, Adele, honey. He cleared his throat, finding it difficult to address her affectionately. He blushed hard. I will go with you and listen to everything you want, so don't worry. He tried to calm her down. What? Her eyes widened with surprise. She couldn't say a word anymore. This woman, why was she responding like that when he was saying he will do everything she wants? Why are you reacting, Dash? He asked angrily. As sorry. I never thought that you would tell me that, honey. She apologized as she realized her obsession and tried to respond to him with the endearment. It was difficult for her as well, but she somehow managed to say so. Their eyes met, both blushing so hard that their cheeks were bright red. Aster and Wacken peeked towards each other with a side eye and smiled. Thank you? She looked directly into his eyes and said shyly, Don't be thankful for every little thing. He abruptly turned around to lessen his embarrassment and continued as he walked away. You are the wife of the duke. You can do whatever you wish, and that is a matter of law. He went inside the house. Wacken and Aster followed him, and she just stood there, looking at his broad back from far away. Can things be slightly different? Was she allowed to expect a tiny bit from him? She thought hopefully, hope shining in her eyes. In the night, it was a house with simple architecture, looking like a residence for middle-class people. Beside the door was a fire pot hanging. Inside the house, a girl with rough clothes and appearance, clothes covered in dirt, and orange-colored hair was bent down over a pot, peering inside. Why? For what reason? Why is it that I cannot see the future of those people? Since when did this change occur? I have to be able to see their futures. She couldn't see the future of Duke Ben Zark, Aster, or Wacken anymore. She couldn't understand what went wrong and where. She was thinking thoughtfully. She definitely saw it before. They were taking her through the forest of darkness. She was in between Aster and Wacken, and Ben Zark was leading the way. She tried everything, but nothing worked. She looked inside the huge pot filled with animal blood. The chicken blood doesn't work, and the sheep and goat blood didn't work either. I even tried pig blood. Forget the future. Even clairvoyance isn't working. I can see everyone else's futures, but why can't I see theirs? This is a huge problem. At this rate, he will classify me as a useless human. She murmured, trying to figure out what went wrong and where.